the reason that fentanyl has crowded out heroin is a reason that fentanyl would have crowded out legitimate prescriptions as well, which is that fentanyl is simply much, much cheaper. It is produced by a competitive market that drives prices basically as close to zero as they conceivably can get. This is Manhattan Insights, a Manhattan Institute production. Charles, it's great to see you. So people have been using drugs for an awfully long time. Uh, you know, certainly when you know I was growing up, I'm a fair bit older than you. But when you were growing up, you know, this was a thing that happened. There were teenagers, there were college students who were experimenting. You know, so it doesn't seem as though there's been a dramatic increase in the number of people using. And yet we've seen this huge increase in the number of people dying. So what's going on here? At, at, at sort of that particular level of specificity, um, I think that that's true. And certainly when you talk about the drugs which are causing the largest scale of harm, the best measures we have suggest that the rates of use have increased somewhat over the past 20 to 30 years. Um, so you see maybe best estimates, 40 percent increases in uses of heroin, uses of methamphetamine, um, plausibly decreases in use of cocaine. But within those same categories of drug, you see order multiple hundreds of percent tripling, quadrupling, sextupling increases in the rates of overdose death. And Charles, just so no one yells at me, just I want to be sure that we're we're uh, drawing some distinctions here. Uh, you're not seeing cannabis users who are dying in the streets, right? So, you know, we're making some distinctions here. Uh, and you've kind of pointed out there's some drugs that have classes of drugs that have been around for a long time, but but something so just give us that big picture overview in terms of how we think about the behavior side of this, the kind of number of users and what have you, and, and kind of which drugs folks are using. And, and, and in some senses, there are two stories going on there, right? On the one hand, there, there is an appreciable increase in the use of marijuana, both the extent, the number of users, and also the intensity, the frequency with which users use. Um, that is almost certainly an effect of increased availability and therefore decreased price facilitated by legalization, uh, not necessarily through the legal supply chain, and we get into that, but certainly facilitated by the reduction in control of marijuana. So so, so we're going to put that to the side. That there's, That's one box. There's the kind of cannabis marijuana box, you know, and that's the thing that's happening, but that's one box. Okay, now there's another box. When we talk about the drugs that are killing people, you talked about 100,000 people. You're talking primarily about synthetic opioids, we're talking about what that means, but uh, the version people are most familiar with is what's called fentanyl, uh, and then also methamphetamine, um, secondarily. What has happened in both cases is, you know, the, the story that I like to tell is that uh, there has been a profound shift in the way in which these drugs and the classes of drugs, because they belong, are produced. The 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, uh, primarily opioids, which is the class that fentanyl belongs to, uh, were organically derived. You grow poppies in a field and then you turn them into heroin. Um, in the in the early 2000s, you also have diverted pharmaceutical opioids. Uh, what we have seen over the past decade is that, in particular, illicit producers of opioids have transitioned from that organic approach to production to a synthetic approach to production. You produce fully synthetic opioids in a lab. You use simple precursor chemicals. They're mostly labs in Mexico. This is the chemicals from China. Um, and that is a dramatic shift in uh, the cost structure, the production structure of the illicit market. Well, slow down, Charles. Let, let's just slow it down for a bit. Okay, so, um, you know, you had this period, there were Korean War veterans returning home. Uh, you know, these were folks who were introduced to, um, you know, opioids, painkillers. Uh, and then, you know, you kind of have, okay, certain kind of heroin. Vietnam War era explosion, you know, you have to go and harvest this. Um, you have to grow it in the jungles of Southeast Asia or, you know, wherever else. You've got to kind of get into the country. There's some real volume here. That's a kind of a meaningful process. That was a big explosion of, of opioid abuse, um, you know, to, to use a term of art. But it was clunky. Uh, you know, it was kind of hard to get it from here to there. And even though it kind of penetrated a wider group of people, for whatever reason, what you're telling me is that it wasn't as deadly. Um, and it was just maybe more expensive, harder to get. You had to be in the right network to get it. So what you're saying is that, as in so many things, um, you know, you had this burst of entrepreneurial innovation. Uh, you had this kind of incredible burst of technological innovation and creativity in this space, what where did it come from? Was it because the kind of smuggling became harder to do or you didn't want to kind of bring in bulky stuff and that became hard? Like, what was the impetus for this um, new technological innovation? It's not perfectly clear because the people who really know don't like to talk to journalists. Um, but 
one thing we know is that the technology has existed for a long time. Fentanyl is formulated in the 1960s. Um, if if you know, when my I want to say when my wife gave birth, her epidural was fentanyl. That's a common application of a cheap synthetic opioid. It's not a new product. What is new is the knowledge of how to produce it. Um, I think the telling fact for me. There are sort of bursts of fentanyl production in the 90s. If you ever remember a conversation with China White, that's fentanyl. Um, but the real transition happens in the 2010s. Some of that is because of the crackdown on prescription opioids in the United States, pushing users from prescription opioids, a new user base addicted to prescription opioids, onto heroin. But that doesn't explain it all. I think uh, likely another component of the story is the breakdown of the old order of the cartels in Mexico. Um, the and and the transition to the current uh, cartel structure, the sort of a very long, bloody, still ongoing, bloody period, um, and that disorder and breaking of the monopoly makes it relatively cost efficient to do the capital investment to you know, to to do the startup investment to make the transition to fentanyl. It's like, well, the heroin trade is already kind of missed. We aren't necessarily maximizing profits. We're pouring stuff into this. And here's an opportunity to really move over to gain a competitive edge against our, you know, against everybody else in the market. Um, it is notable that fentanyl is currently mostly an American problem, uh, that Europe still basically has a heroin problem and that has to do with we, America, America gets its drugs from Mexico. Most of Europe gets its drugs from Southeast Asia. For whatever reason, the Southeast Asian cartels haven't made the transition yet. They are still in local equilibrium where growing heroin in Myanmar uh, is a better profit proposition for them than making the investments needed to go to fentanyls. Fascinating. So it could be that, you know, I wonder if part of the story is that interdiction, um, you know, of those supplies from Southeast Asia, you know, that poses more of a barrier when you're, you know, have to, you know, cross an ocean, um, but that partly it's the market structure uh, of the suppliers uh, where there was this new incentive for low-cost innovation and that, you know, the, the fentanyl stuff that, you know, you can transport in tiny amounts, right? So it's just kind of intrinsically easier to smuggle. Yeah, there's there's a lot of benefit there, although I think that the, the sort of the story with the iron law of prohibition, that all else equal prohibition drives down, it increases the potency of drugs because more potency is smaller, is easier to smuggle, can only ever be part of the story simply for the reason that in the period when the fentanyl transition happens, which is the second half of the Obama administration, 2014, 2015, around then, uh, there are not higher levels than usual of border enforcement and interdiction. Um, the administration is actually shifting away from, to some extent, uh, international focus in its drug interdiction strategy. So the, the enforcement costs have not gone up appreciably. You know, mm. There are some people who would say it's because the enforcement costs have gone down appreciably. Uh, and I mostly think that that story is also not persuasive. But ultimately, you know, I, I, I suspect what's happening there is just somebody found the right chemist at the right time and it yeah. made sense. And once it made sense, you get a market shift. The equilibrium shifts. And then everyone has to compete that way. And you have people who learn, who know how to use this, who know how to produce this. That knowledge diffuses, um, you know, to competing organizations and, and what have you. So suddenly you have this um, incredible new product. Now, I'll just note briefly, um, there was a conversation we had about opioids that you briefly gestured towards, um, you know, before the 20, well, kind of, you know, still trailing into the 2010s about hey, you know, people are prescribing painkillers. Hey, you've got these unscrupulous companies that are kind of doing this terrible thing and you kind of have these medical practitioners who are corrupted by pharma money. What you're saying is that that story is basically over. And, um, you know, that was over a long time ago. Yes, there were initially some people were then transitioning to heroin and what have you, but now we're in a kind of different moment. Is that a fair characterization? Yeah, and parenthetically, that's a frustration I have with media depictions of the drug crisis in general. Um, yes, there was a period of time and there is persuasive evidence that the actions in this period of time contribute substantially to current problems where major pharmaceutical firms, Purdue Pharma is sort of the obvious one, but there were other ones, were taking advantage of uh, general perceptions of the safety of opioids that were unmerited to engage in mass prescribing um, uh, and to facilitate mass prescribing, including through unethical doctors who ran pain mills, uh, which were essentially licensed drug dealers. Um, that almost certainly increased addiction. There's a lot of debate about among which population is the people who receive the drugs. I think 
I am generally persuaded that it's more that it created a readily divertible supply. So they were handing out lots of pills. The pills got moved onto the street, and that created a pool of addiction to some extent. So I got a two-week supply of something where, you know, I, I only need it for a couple of days, and then you sell it, and then it's out there, and then, exactly. you know, the, the taste exactly. for the drug. Okay, got it. Exactly. Uh, you have you have oxys. You, you have a bunch of leftover oxys, or you go to the pain mill to get some oxys, and then you sell them to somebody else, or you steal some oxys from your aunt. There's a survey in the late 2010s, I think, where they asked people where they got their first drugs, and overwhelmingly, the answer is they got it, they were sold it, or they bought it, or they stole it from somebody else rather than they got it through a prescription. So, okay. So then, you know, that was one phase. We're kind of past that phase. Do you think it's fair to say that we're kind of past it now because of the wave of more stringent regulations, because of laws that were passed that were kind of cracking down? Or do you think that it was more, um, you know, the wave crested, you know, this thing happened, just kind of went away on its own? Like, do you think that policy was actually efficacious in taking care of that kind of pharma-driven contribution to widespread addiction? I would say that it accelerated the transition or it accelerated sort of clearing that issue. Um, Purdue Pharma is initially sued, again, during the early Obama administration, uh, prescribing rates per capita peak, I think, in 2012, although I'd have to confirm that. Um, there's enormous pressure from the DEA. It takes them a long time to notice, but once they notice, you know, the, the pharmaceutical supply chain in the United States is extremely stringently controlled. The DEA knows how much of which controlled substances are produced and distributed each year, and they can set those caps. So it's pretty easy to ratchet that back. I bring this up partly because there is this debate. There are some people who would argue that, hey, we crack down on the pain mills, uh, and we do stringently control that supply. And lo and behold, now you've had this ironic effect. You know, you've kind of had this, um, you know, perverse effect of driving people into this kind of lower cost illicit market. Now, um, I wonder what you make of that, because I suppose one argument could be, hey, actually, you know, maybe the pain wheels were preferable uh, to this ex explosion of illicit activity outside. And also just, hey, may maybe some of these medical practitioners uh, were not the most circumspect or ethically, <laughs> you know, kind of sound uh, people. But hey, there was at least some control. But then here you have something that is not controlled, where you really know nothing about the dose. What do you make of that argument? That was, I mean, that was the other half um, you know, I'd say no. I, I would say yes, there's there's a policy effect, but no, it doesn't ultimately explain all the transition. Because what you see over and over again in historical drug crises is that a new drug, and in the 90s, America was a largely opioid-naive population. Heroin had been out for about 20 years. In the 90s, uh, a new drug comes in, much like, for example, cocaine in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, people start using, it becomes very popular, it's socially, saying, it's socially approved of, uh, and then problem use begins to emerge. Heroin chic is an idea that the older among us will remember. Yeah, think about think about the cocaine to crack transition. The same thing happens. It happens, by the way, with amphetamines. It happens. This happens over and over and over again in the history of drug use. Arguably, yeah. there are fads and fashions that emerge and then take and then persist and then fade. And so, you know, I think you would have seen progression to problematic use, more aggressive use, anyway. And just as importantly, the the reason that fentanyl has crowded out heroin is a reason that fentanyl would have crowded out legitimate prescriptions as well, which is that heroin, fentanyl is simply much, much cheaper. It is produced by a competitive market, a comparatively competitive market that drives prices basically as close to zero as they conceivably can get. Um, I've reported from Portland, Oregon, where you can buy fentanyl on the street for two bucks a pill, two bucks a dose. Uh, that's when you're competing with an oxy, which is something like a dollar a milligram, um, but used to be the going rate. There's no competition. So, of course, you know, I, I, I think the transition would have happened anyway because the driving force is ultimately that, that innovation that we were talking about earlier. I wonder, um, Charles, uh, I gather you are not yourself someone who's um, used these narcotics, but I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the subjective experience. So, uh, you know, you talk about their fads and fashions. You know, these are things you kind of pick up this behavior from others, and some of these can be, you know, kind of acutely um, addictive. Uh, but I, I'm curious to hear about um, you know, your understanding of the sensation. Uh, you know, so fentanyl is something that, as you noted, is used um, as a, a kind of anesthetic. You know, it is used in, in medical practice under highly controlled conditions, typically. But then, you know, if you're someone who's just using, who's seeking this out, who's seeking, um, you know, street level 
opioids out, um, you know, is it something that is meant to calm you down? Is it something that is, uh, talk to me about, you know, the nature of the experience. And you can, many, although not all drugs can be topologized as uppers or downers, um, and opioids in general are a downer. Uh, their central nervous system depression. Part of the reason that opioids are so deadly is because they cause you, they depress your central nervous system. If you overdose, you can stop breathing. Um, they are also associated with sort of a pleasant feeling of relaxation. They're euphoriant. Um, they are, they are, you know, it's, 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 it's an experience of sort of being calm and at peace. Not everyone experiences that way. There's high variation in the character of the experience. Some people get itchy. Um, some people can be more energetic, although that's unusual. But in general, it's it's a uh, it's sort of a, a, a relaxer. Um, think about popular depictions of opium smokers. It's like that, but more so. At the risk of you know drawing overly broad generalizations, one wonders if um, when you're looking at younger people, um, you know, think about the explosion of ADHD diagnoses, the widespread use of anti-anxiety medications, um, you know, that are oftentimes prescribed quite casually and have become a big part of popular culture. You think about SoundCloud rap and references to Xanax and what have you. This is I'm dating myself a bit here, uh, but. Um, you know, I wonder if – do you see that as something of a pathway where, um, you know, the kind of comfort level with uh, mood-altering prescription drugs is something that made people more receptive? Or is it eh, – that's not really it. There's some people who are always going to be using illicit narcotics, and the big issue is that these things are just more deadly. I'm, I'm curious how you think about the kind of cultural element. You know, I I think that we are in general – far more comfortable with drug use than we were 20 to 30 years ago. It's not as stigmatized as it was. It, it's certainly far less stigmatized. Um, and, you know, I might not say that any particular characteristic of any particular drug is sort of uniquely attuned to our moment because Americans are consuming so many different kinds of uppers and downers and psychoactive substances and uh, psychedelic substances and benzodiazepines. But it's actually the case that Many of the deaths that we see today are what are called polydrug overdoses, where people are taking not just opioids, but opioids and a Xanax, a benzodiazepine, or an opioid and methamphetamine, or opioids and cocaine. Um, and that very clearly, that mixing of drugs, uh, I don't want to discount the sort of power of people die from drug overdoses because they're addicted to drugs, because that is sort of the core fact. But I do believe separately that we are much more approving of or tacitly accepting of drug use than we were 30 years ago. And that's true across the board. And something that we will, um, you know, touch on further. But, um, you know, this has been a cultural project. And in a way, one could argue that the cultural project has been a great success. We have destigmatized, um, you know, narcotic use, chemical dependence of, you know, various sorts. And, um, you know, one could argue that this is one of the fruits of that um, larger cultural project of, of destigmatizing uh, drug use. It's certainly a removal of the brakes for uh, controlling the independent increase. Uh, it, is, it is much harder to say to the marginal person, you should not try drugs because there's a risk associated with it when generally there's a great deal of licensing of drug use. You've been um, writing very perceptively about fentanyl. Um, fentanyl is, uh, you know, part of a larger category of lab-produced drugs. Uh, another is, uh, you know, when you're looking at uh, methamphetamines. You know, this is another problem, a problem that is evolving as well, uh, you know, quite widespread. I wonder if you could talk to us about some of the contrasts uh, between fentanyl and meth. Uh, and it seems that the way that meth is produced seems to have a meaningful effect uh, on its um, effect uh, on one's um, cognitive ability, uh, overall health. Uh, but I wonder if you could kind of, um, you know, walk us through the distinctions and also just the different populations, perhaps, um, that are using these drugs. Yeah. So in the most sort of go in order, um, the production of, so, so, so at root, they're the product of a, the same phenomenon insofar as today's meth is mostly produced in very large labs in Mexico using simple precursor chemicals in the same way that fentanyl is. Um, Which drives down the cost. Yeah, exactly. Um, if, you, if, you, if you watch you know, Breaking Bad and you think about uh, the transition from somebody cooking meth in a trailer in the desert to working for the Mexicans, that's what happened in the real economy too, although on a different timeline. Um, 
you know, methamphetamine is a different drug. It, it's, 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 it's an upper, it's a stimulant. It makes things go faster. Um, it's, a, it's an amphetamine. Uh, it makes things, people think more clearly. Um, it can also lead to uh, m- many myths that have to do with a uh, heart attack or stroke um, or other coronary failure. So really different in a sense. I mean, and potentially a very different market, very different population that's drawn to it. So at least at current, um, the, the sort of broad claim that I like to make is that today, and this is decreasingly true, but certainly several years ago, fentanyl was an East Coast thing and meth was a West Coast thing. And now you're getting them, they're sort of mingling together and you see fentanyl on the West Coast more and meth on the East Coast a little bit less. It really has, meth hasn't really gotten to the East Coast yet, but it's it's coming. Um, that to some extent represents different populations who use, but it also represents the networks, the contingent circumstances of kind of how this stuff sold. Yeah. Yeah. Drug markets are highly inefficient because of prohibition, which means you're going to get slow diffusion. Whereas you, you know, if, if meth were in Walmarts, it would be uh, everywhere immediately. So you've talked about uh, the kind of cost revolution, the kind of business model revolution that's happened that's contributed to the rise of these lab-produced drugs. Uh, To return to fentanyl for a moment, one thing you certainly hear is that uh, there are a great many drugs that are adulterated. There are a great many drugs that are blended, not even in the spirit of the kind of polydrug crisis you're describing, but just you think you're getting cocaine. You think you're getting it from a reliable source. Maybe you think you're getting um, methylone, MDMA, or what have you. But it seems that many of these substances have fentanyl in them. Am I getting that right? And I wonder if you could talk to us a bit about how that works. Yeah. Um, and it's a little bit unclear why that's happening, what the different incentives driving that are. But it is generally the case that many sort of the drug supply for casual drug users, the large majority of people who are using on the weekends, who are using at festivals, uh, is also inc- uh, is also increasingly adulterated with a variety of additions. Um, although it's also the case that the the supply used by people who use most compulsively is adulterated. Um, that can happen at a number of different steps uh, in the process. Some of it is if you're trying to sell to a casual user to convert them to a compulsive user, you want to give them the most addicting substance. Um, some of it is just that stepping on well, and, and by the way is it fair to say that fentanyl is just unusually addictive or is this just folk wisdom i mean just do we have any hard evidence yeah it's highly it's 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 a highly potent opioid so the the opioid experience is particularly strong so it's particularly addictive in that regard um on the other hand if you stepped on mdma with heroin that would have a similar effect it wouldn't be a cost efficient proposition um uh, some of it is just that uh, adulteration has always been a way that uh, basically price is managed in the illicit market. That you all, the, the the concept of a dime bag that you're buying, you you pay a fixed price for then heroin, um, and the actual price per uh, the the price from the original producer passes through to you in terms of potency rather than uh, price that you're actually. Wow. So just the, the inflation you see uh, at the pump or in the supermarket uh, aisle is something that you're also seeing in this world. And so fentanyl is so dirt cheap that, you know, basically, hey, we mislead people into believing that they're getting this amount of cocaine. Got it. And the, the, the other reality is that people, you know, it's, 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 it's all white psychoactive powders. Uh, if, you, if you buy MDMA and you take the MDMA and you feel super weird... You don't really know what was in it to begin with. And maybe you die, but maybe you don't. Maybe you go back to the same guy. Maybe it feels a little bit better. Um, it is also the case that, I mean, fentanyl has a, all drugs have sort of a, a fragmented supply chain. So it's hard to impose quality standards from the top down. And by the way, that is something that um, advocates of legalization will often raise. That is, um, you know, the claim, as I understand it, is that when you're looking at many overdoses, inconsistent dosing is a big part of the story. Uh, purity is a big part of the story. And uh, so if we had a more stringently regulated market, um, you know, then we would get the exact right dose and what have you. Um, you know, I wonder, you know, you seem skeptical about that and I kind of, you know, We'd be curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah. I mean, I think the choice is always between prohibition and not. I mean, sort of, there's there's stuff in between that we can talk about. But from with regards to that question in particular, either you are talking about a regulated licit market or you are talking about an illicit market. The downside to the illicit market is that it is not subject to 
transparency regulations. The upside to the illicit market is that there are not large companies trying to sell highly addictive, life-destroying substances. Um, as I and others like to observe, the number of deaths attributable to tobacco and alcohol every year dwarfs the number of deaths associated with illicit drugs. Uh, and that's because one of them is prohibited and the other one is not. Um, just sort of, we can imagine what the scale of the problem would be as if you could buy fentanyl on Amazon. Uh, and so, you know, there are certainly those who maintain that, but for better information, people would not choose to use fentanyl. I don't think that that's true. I don't think it's borne out by the research. Um, when you give people fentanyl test strips and their drug is a test positive for fentanyl, they still use the drugs. Uh, which means that they are engaging in what is rational behavior for somebody who is suffering from an opioid addiction. They want to satisfy their addiction, and that satisfaction is more important than the risk associated with uh, pursuing that satisfaction. Charles, this is very relevant to the ongoing debate uh, over harm reduction. Uh, there are many cities uh, throughout North America uh, that have embraced uh, safe injection sites. New York City has experimented with the idea. Um, certainly when you're looking at the Pacific Northwest, uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, and up in Canada, uh, if you're looking at uh, Portland, Seattle, you know, this is something that, you know, it seems to have really taken root there as a kind of policy innovation. Uh, and uh, I wonder, uh, you know, kind of if you could tell us a bit about this, both about the impulse behind it um, and, and also just about your general assessment, having done some work on safe injection sites. I will say that there are many very credentialed people. In fact, I would go so far as to argue that among you know credentialed experts on narcotics abuse, it seems like a near consensus that safe injection sites are the right thing to do, they're life-saving, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I wonder if you could talk to us about the big picture there. Yeah, talking specifically about uh, what I might call supervised injection site, well, and elaborate on that. So, you know, so I am using the right term as it's used by advocates. They call them safe injection sites. But what I'm hearing from you is that you don't think that safe is the right word to use in this context. 75% of drug policy is policing other people's language, unfortunately. Um, and, and, and my objection is, look, the reality is that if you are injecting a potentially, over, a potentially overdosing addicting drugs, um, you're not making a safe choice. Uh, I, the, the fact that there's somebody standing nearby with naloxone doesn't mean that injecting myself with fentanyl is a safe choice. Um, usually the, uh, often the political effect term is safer consumption or safer supply. Uh, it doesn't really matter. The thing about the supervised consumption sites, you know, I think if there's, a, uh, as, as, as my friend Keith Humphreys, the Stanford addiction specialist says, there are more articles every year about supervised consumption sites than there are actual supervised consumption sites on earth. Um, which, you know, these sites have existed in Europe for decades. Um, two things are true. One is that they have not caused mass death. And the other thing is that they haven't really reduced substantially opioid overdose deaths. Uh, and they have not really substantially scaled. There isn't one of these on every block. Nobody wants that. It doesn't seem to do anything. Hate to put you on the spot, but what you're telling me is that it's not as though 40% of the drugs being consumed in Portland, Oregon, are being consumed at the so-called safe injection sites. Uh, you know, this is pretty marginal in the overall picture, but they're but so they're cult they're culturally symbolically meaningful as flashpoints of the debate. Is that yeah? Yes, yes, I think that's right. Um, I I'll, I'll have a piece coming out in City Journal soonish. Uh, that we got some data from New York supervised consumption site on point. Uh, I, they, they report the number of p visits and the number of users and about 10,000 unique people who have been through on point at some point in its first year of operation. They report about 48,000 visits. Uh, that sounds like a lot until you do the math. I work out it's about 300 a day. If you have 10,000 people in the catchment area, each of them is using one to three times a day, very conservatively. That's 30,000 uses in a day. So 3,000 visits a day, 30,000 uses in a day, you do the math. Um, it's just not covering a substantial fraction, anything like a substantial fraction of drug use, even its catchment area, never mind the rest of New York. So Charles, is the, is the answer that we need to give vastly more money to the, you know, the thoughtful, experienced, compassionate people behind these safer injection sites so that they can capture a larger share of the people um, using these otherwise dangerous drugs. Yeah, you know, my view is that you are never going to build 
supervised consumption sites at a scale where they're going to have impact um, in any meaningful sense. Uh, and even then, the thing about, and this is a criticism of harm reduction more broadly, and we can sort of get into what that means. Uh, people talk about supervised consumption sites, so let's say nobody has ever died in a supervised consumption site. But if you plop them down in a place, overdose deaths don't actually decline. There isn't a macro effect. And the reason for this is that just reversing somebody's overdose does not actually uh, appreciably reduce the risk that they will overdose again subsequently when they are not around somebody in the naloxone. You are never going to blanket every block in America with naloxone and with people willing to use it. It's not going to happen. Although people have certainly tried. I mean, you know, this is an anecdote, which is always dangerous. But, you know, you do hear um, here in New York City uh, from bartenders and what have you that uh, there is now an obligation to be trained to deploy uh, naloxone. And um, it happens. You know, people routinely do this. There are folks working in the service industry where this has now become just as you're supposed to know where the fire extinguisher is. uh, You know, you're supposed to know where that is. And there are people who are being called upon to administer um, these drugs in bathrooms. And uh, it really seems like a, I'll just say, a pretty heavy burden on the part of those folks who just, you know, want to be bartenders, want to be servers in restaurants. But, you know, let's leave that aside. But it seems so there has really been an effort to make this available over the counter. Um, you know, I, I wonder what you think about that. Because, you know, from one perspective, um, you know, there is the desire to avoid deaths, um, of course, but you were talking earlier on about stigma and how do we think about the balance uh, of risks here and what have you. So I, I'm curious about your instinct uh, on this idea of making naloxone, you know, more widely available. So, you know, I see it as a cost benefit calculation. I, in my view, it is intrinsically good to save people's lives in the short run. Um, so I'm not particularly averse to naloxone distribution, while at the same time acknowledging that the balance of the evidence suggests that Increasing availability of naloxone does not appreciably reduce overdose deaths. Um, the reason for this one study observes uh, in tracks a cohort of people administering naloxone, 15% of them are dead within a year. Um, that's a much higher death rate than people not administering naloxone experience in a given year. Um, and that's because the underlying cause of their overdose, which is their addiction to serious, dead, often deadly drugs, has not been addressed. Um, and naloxone is a band aid on that. And you wouldn't go so far as to claim that it's also increasing consumption, right? I mean, because, you know, that... I don't think the evidence is there. There's sort of one study that maybe kind of finds that effect in one area, but my read of the balance of the evidence is that it doesn't actively in and of itself increase consumption. Look, that said, uh, short-running elasticities and long-running elasticities are different. Do I believe that there is some contribution in naloxone to tolerance for drug use in the long run? Yeah, probably. Um, kids who see naloxone in their schools think differently about drugs than they don't. Do I think that that small effect is counterbalanced by the benefit in lives shaved and shorn? Yes, I do. Do I find that particularly more persuasive in the case of many other harm reduction interventions? Yeah, absolutely. We talk about uh, quote unquote safe smoking kits, which, as far as I can tell, have no health benefit whatsoever, but absolutely are the government licensing drug consumption. Charles, what is a safe smoking kit? So, a safe smoking kit is a government funded crack pipe. Uh, there's a great deal of controversy around this. Uh, thanks to my former colleagues at the Washington Free Beacon. Um, uh, usually, a safe smoking kit contains um, foil, uh, a glass stem, a pipe, um, sometimes a lighter. Uh, the theory of safe smoking kits, the justification of them is twofold. One I find persuasive, which is that smoking is safer than injecting. Um, and I would find that persuasive if it were not for the fact that the same programs always also hand out needles, so there's no forcing substitution. The other argument is something like if I am smoking and I have crack, I have hep C or AIDS and I have cracks on my lips and there's dried blood on the pipe and then we share the pipe and you also have cracked lips, then the dried blood can be transmitted to you and you can get, there is no documented evidence of this ever actually happening. It's in my mind absurd. And I think it's very telling that this is sort of a post hoc justification, a sort of made up justification for but I think the primary goal here of this kind of policy for many of its advocates, which is they would like it to be easier and more pleasant to consume drugs. At the risk of taking us on a tangent, I wonder what you think about the cultural political dynamic at play here. Now, um, you know, you talk about the controversy over safe smoking kits. Uh, it really does feel 
from the perspective of a kind of, you know, I don't know, middle-aged bourgeois dad, just like, well, you know, this is real catnip, um, you know, for finding something totally outrageous and ridiculous. Uh, but when you're looking at the drug policy community, do you see it as kind of a pushing of the envelope, you know, going deeper into this idea that we need to destigmatize? Is it a kind of earnest look at the empirical evidence? Uh, I mean, I just got to wonder how you interpret, uh, because it sure seems like, you know, someone would think, you know what, this, even if I think this is an okay idea, this is certainly going to be kind of embarrassing. Uh, so I'm just kind of wondering about the thought process there. Yeah. You know, I think that there was a detente in drug policy 20, 30 years ago, um, really starting in the, in the academy and it's spread since then into government and public life where they said, the things that we're doing in the 80s and 90s, we don't like. Um, and I have I'm both, I, I see pros and cons in the 80s and 90s drug war approach, but I don't think it was perfect. Um, I, I see some of those arguments. And they said, well, we need a public health approach to drug policy. Um, but what that means often bifurcates into two very different camps. So some people say we should not be you know, locking people up for 20 years for smoking drugs, but we need to be very proactive about Which doesn't happen, by the way, but let's bracket that. Yeah. But at least we're proactive about prevention. We need to preserve prohibition. We need to focus on treatment. We need to continue to stigmatize drugs. When we talk about destigmatization, it's about making sure people get the treatment they need. Drug use is still very bad. Versus another clack of people who very much believe that the pro you know in in this almost to be philosophically Rousseauian sense believe that the problem is not drugs per se. It is the structures that have controlled, restrained. Uh, and otherwise shape drug use um, and that we have to target those structures and who think that drug use is intrinsically very good. Um, often, both of those people speak in the same language to the public. They talk about the drug war is bad. They talk about the need for public health. But these are, in fact, different strains of thought. They mean very different things. There's also an intersection with race discourse. Uh, and, you know, again, this could, you know, send us down to a cul-de-sac. But I'm curious if you could talk about that because, you know, you've written a lot about some of the, the thinkers, the theorists um, advancing destigmatization. And it does seem like one classic argument, certainly shaping this narrative about the war on drugs and, and why legalization is a, a kind of social justice move, uh, is that... Um, is this argument that we stigmatize certain drugs because they're disproportionately used by people of color? This is how they seek pleasure. You know, this is just something that is a cultural practice. Rather than respecting that difference, that cultural practice, we are militarizing enforcement efforts, and and that ex that stems from this kind of racial contempt. Am I getting that roughly right about you know kind of uh, an argument that's out there in the world? I mean, I should right, and 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 you know, look. A, I think that argument works by cherry picking history. It says the crack cocaine crisis was responded to with fairly aggressive uh, police tactics, um, and the opioid crisis sort of was treated with a more public health approach. And the opioid crisis was initially an issue for white people, and the crack cocaine crisis was primarily among black people. Therefore, and my response to this is: first of all, the opioid crisis is now an issue among the black population. Um, the cocaine was a white people issue, poor was a black people issue. And what generally are crackdown on are crackdowns on drug drugs, have they been perfectly free of racism? No, I can find a lot of bad quotes from Harry Anslinger, the first federal drugs are, um, saying racist things. It was the 1930s, a lot of people said racist things. Uh, but we have been perfectly willing to crack down on drugs, very popular among white people, uh, on marijuana, on psychedelics, on amphetamines, on heroin. Um, so, so, you know, I, A, I think they're engaged in historical cherry picking, but B, look, even the substance of the argument is, uh, it is, it is, it is saying that ultimately we should let, because black people are minority and are minorities, we should let them do things that are harmful to their health. We should let them engage in self-harm because it is part of their culture. And my view is that that's condescending. Um, this is perhaps an old school argument, but I'm willing to make an old school argument that marijuana is bad. Or drug use is bad for black people as well as white people. And, you know, the, the particulars of who uses more or less don't need to enter into it in that regard. You have talked about this technological business model breakthrough um, in lab-produced drugs and particularly in fentanyl. Um, you know, we see that um, there hasn't necessarily been 
a dramatic change in the number of people who are using opioids, yet there's been a, as you put it, order of magnitude increase in the number of deaths. So clearly this is a public policy issue that is of urgent concern. Um, you know, uh, tastes vary as to kind of to what extent we should prioritize this over other things. But, you know, your work has suggested, you have argued that we're not taking this nearly seriously enough. What would taking it seriously look like, recognizing that there's a spectrum of outcomes? They're saying that, you know, let's wage war on Mexico and bomb fentanyl clinics and what have you. Uh, and then there's, you know, kind of things that might be a little bit more tractable. Uh, you know, I wonder if you could talk to us about what you see as realistic approaches, um, you know, what you'd want to do, but also things that you see as tractable given cost and other considerations. Yeah. So in terms of bang for the buck, um, usually I focus on three areas. One is dramatically expanding the availability of and usage of treatment. Um, the best tool available for deterring drug, for reducing drug use from people who currently use is getting them off of drugs. Um, that means things that conservatives may be uncomfortable with, like using medication-assisted treatment, um, methadone and buprenorphine, um, and things that liberals may be uncomfortable with, which is to say compelled inpatient or outpatient treatment, uh, which is underutilized as far as I can measure. Um, you know, I think I, I, treatment sort of has to be the silver bullet for the for the drug using population. Um, when you target everybody else, we spend forty billion dollars a year on drugs, which is a drop in the bucket of the, at the federal level of the federal budget. Uh, of that, we spend a little more than two billion dollars a year on primary prevention, which is the term used to refer to uh, efforts to deter to discourage people from using drugs through education, public messaging, etc. And there's a certain fatalism about that now you know this um people ridiculing the dare program arguing that it actually might have actually destigmatized um uh, drug abuse but uh, there's there's one study of a series of people exposed to dare where one of the cohorts gets uh gets um more likely to use marijuana in the follow up uh look dare is one example of prevention programming we know that it is possibly prevention programming right because prevention programming is integral to the enormous success America's had in reducing teen smoking over the past 20 years. Um, we have successfully dramatically reduced what was once a very common and very harmful behavior. Uh, there's, that said, there's a lot that we don't know about how to do prevention right. I have some ideas. Um, I think there are a lot of things that we're very much at the forefront of, but we spend almost nothing on it. So it's it's a little bit like the Simpsons mean we've tried nothing and we're all out of ideas. Well, maybe we can try something. Interesting. So, you know, part of what you're saying is that, um, you know, the trend in public health circles and what have you has been toward destigmatization. But, you know, we could use even some modest investment in thinking about primary prevention. So you you said three things. One, expanding treatment. Two is investing in prevention. And then and three is sort of writ large thinking about how to handle specifically the problem of Mexico. Um, I am pretty skeptical of the hawks in the GOP primary who led to invade Mexico. Um, I don't think that that's a tractable solution to the problem. Uh, I think we have tried to make some strides on border control, but border control is an enormous issue and there's much more that we could conceivably do there, um, both interdiction between points of entry, but also thinking about what are the costs and benefits associated with flow at within points of entry. Some of that's as simple as getting the migrant crisis under control. Uh, but it's also thinking about can you whitelist carriers versus blacklist carriers? Uh, how do you identify people who are uh, risks for flowing drugs across the border? Um, there's a lot that we're not sure about how to get that right. I think it's a tremendously challenging problem. But again, much of what differentiates the United States is simply that we have a great deal of goods entering our country from a, another country with an uncontrolled drug production problem. And so until we do something about that, until we take some substantial steps, that's going to be a major issue. So you wouldn't describe yourself as a wild-eyed optimist if you adopt Charles Lehman's uh, $100 billion for the next 10 years plan, um, you know, this problem will be, you know, done with. But it sounds like you're also not totally fatalistic. You do believe there are meaningful policy interventions uh, that can make a difference, that there are prevention programs that show promise, uh, and that treatment is something that we are capable of scaling up? Yes. Well, and, you know, I think part of why I believe that is because so much of our drug policy thinking and infrastructure is stuck in a time period where uh, 
uh, drugs were, what do they say, drugs were a health problem, now they're a death's problem. The problem of drug use used to be the harms of long-term addiction. Now the problem is that people are getting poisoned to death. Um, we don't take the problem seriously enough. We don't have infrastructure at scale relevant to the death's problem. But that suggests to me that there are linear increases in capacity that can have returns. Um, I ultimately think that just like every other drug fad, the thing that will reduce deaths will be people realizing that drug use is just a bad idea now. But certainly government can hasten that process in, 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 in the shorter run. Charles, there are two other things I'd like to discuss with you, and you've been very generous with your time. One is um, if you could give us a brief sense of the intersection, the interaction between uh, drugs and homelessness. Homelessness is, is almost not even the word for it. I mean, you're looking at very extreme conditions. People who are not people who, you know, got evicted or between things or, you know, in a crisis that is fundamentally episodic, that is fundamentally temporary. Uh, but, you know, just a really um, persistent, extreme uh, form of vagrancy that has become a real public policy issue in cities and states across the country. That's one. And then I do want to touch briefly uh, on the cannabis question. So first, let's go to the interaction between uh, drugs um, and street homelessness, as you understand it. Sam Quinones has, has offered some provocative theories about what's going on here, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. Right. And uh, Quinones' theory is that the reformulation of the journalist Sam Quinones, uh, author of Dreamland and a number of other well-regarded books about the drug crisis. And his theory is that the reformulation of methamphetamine and its production has led to an increase in schizophrenia among the homeless population on the West Coast. I'm a little less convinced of this than he is. I think there are a couple of good counter arguments, including basically the, the, the kind of meth that we're seeing today is not new. We saw it in the 70s, didn't. Um, and then what generally, you know, I think fights over this bracket, the fact that methamphetamine in general increases risk, methamphetamine use increases risks of schizophrenia and psychotic break. Um, so simply, a, a lot of that variation simply could be explained by the widespread availability of highly potent meth. Um, that said, you know, there's uh, a very live fight about the extent to which drug use causes homelessness versus homelessness causes drug use. But I think it is hard to say that it's hard to disagree that the problem of drug use is not is, is is excuse me the problem of drug use is exacerbated by the problem of homelessness is exacerbated by drug use. That referring to the chronically homeless population, people who are visibly homeless, uh, who live actually on the street, do not live in shelters, are socially disruptive, um, are dealing with multiple intersecting uh, pathologies. Um, that population, their behavior is almost certainly exacerbated both by the effects of consuming drugs like methamphetamine or... Of course, and there's also mental illness. You know, this is something where, you know, there are people who are self-medicating um, with narcotics. Uh, so it, it can be a kind of complex interaction, I imagine. Right. Well, and, but, but, but it's also the case that their pursuit of those substances will affect their behavior. Um, uh, 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 a colleague of mine or a friend of mine who uh, works on this issue in Oregon um, shared with me some data, something like three quarters, when they looked at this in the early 2000s, something like three quarters of property offending in the state of Oregon was attributable to people stealing stuff to sell to feed their addiction. Um, so drug addiction compounds the social harm associated with chronic homelessness in a wide variety of ways, not both for the individual, but also into the community harm. Tell us about your views on marijuana. Now, you know, at the beginning of our conversation, we were very careful to say, we're going to put these in separate boxes. Uh, when you're looking at, uh, you know, marijuana, it really does seem like the policy regime uh, governing marijuana, well, first of all, it's, it's highly variegated across the U.S. But, you know, it does seem as though that is a distinct issue. Uh, and I wonder if you could talk to us a bit about the big picture there. About about marijuana policy or about marijuana policy? Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, legalization, uh, support for legalization uh, saw a, an enormous increase over the past 20 years. My sense is that that um, rate of increase has slowed and, and may even have reversed modestly. But, you know, it, this is something where it used to be just a bunch of, you know, college kids wanted to legalize. And now this has become 
close to a consensus view um, in state after state. Uh, you see this among Republicans and Democrats, young and old. It, it really is a quite dramatic change in public opinion. Um, but you know, I wonder if you could talk to us a bit about what we've seen as we've moved toward a new regime for regulating marijuana. Yeah, right. And and you know, there there are two public opinion shifts that look like that. There's marijuana and same sex marriage, and they're just sui generis. It's it's hard to explain what happened except sort of in the particulars of that situation. Um, as regards marijuana, you know, the, the fight in the 70s is really, it's really, there's, there's a series of steps, right? We start with sort of narrow marijuana use in the 1960s as a college campus phenomenon. Um, and then in the 70s, the fight is about decriminalization. Uh, there is a handful of states that decriminalized in the 1970s and been decriminalized since then. Um, the push through the next several decades is for quote unquote medical marijuana, marijuana for medical applications. And then obviously starting in the 2010s, the rise of legalization, which is sort of a weird concept because they were ma- marijuana remains legal. It's a schedule one federally controlled substance. Um, but so you produce this sort of patchwork of policies where. So it's kind of quasi legalization. Somehow it's sort of semi legal at the state level. Not at the federal level. Can you, you, you know, it, it seems quite fascinating. I think an important thing about marijuana legalization in an American context is that there, there are wide, there's a wide space between full criminal penalization of marijuana and full legalization. And indeed, there's a full, uh, a broad space of legalization for for availability, um, legalizing growing your own, legalizing gifting marijuana, legalizing marijuana clubs. That other countries have implemented with varying success. I wouldn't. You can debate about that. But, um, but what it's telling to me in the United States is that we don't have that kind of sort of legalized but non-profitized marijuana. Um, that is, in my view, sort of inimical to what America is as a country. We are not the, the the idea that we could have legal marijuana without having a marijuana industry. I'm suspicious that it can work in the long run in other countries too. But it was never going to work in the United States, and so most states in the United States that have a legal marijuana regime or are setting one up are doing so with an eye towards having commercial marijuana, marijuana that is produced by commercial producers and then distributed by commercial distributors. Um, and th- th- that, I think, is sort of the most impactful change. Much of the impetus here, and when you talk about that cultural embrace of entrepreneurship, it comes from the belief that you know cannabis is ultimately harmless. Uh, I think there are a lot of people when you're looking at baby boomers. There's the sense that hey, you know, hey, Bill Clinton didn't inhale, but you know, let's face it, everyone was using this um, at the time. And uh, the idea that opposition to marijuana legalization is censorious, it's coming from people who hate fun or who are lacking in compassion or who just fail to understand that, hey, there are some people out there who are are a bit anxious and this is something that helps them relax. There are high-functioning professionals out there who maybe use it once or twice a week. Um, You know, that seems like a big impetus behind legalization. And yet it does seem as though... There is such a thing as, uh, I guess, what the scholars call cannabis use disorder, uh, and it does seem as though it's on the rise. And also, relatedly, it does seem as though there might be something different uh, about the cannabis that's being consumed today uh, as opposed to what was being consumed a generation or two ago. So talk to us about how that has changed. Yeah, there were, and there are were, there were three points I've hit there. One is, as you alluded to, today's legal product is much more potent than the illegal product. Um, as you alluded to Jonathan Calkins, the drug policy scholar, he makes the great point that marijuana legalization explodes uh, the iron law of prohibition um, because they legalized and then big legal companies said, oh, we can distill 99% THC, we can grow 30% THC strains. Great, people love that. Um, so the product is simply much more potent. And that's relevant both because sort of potency is a scary term, but really because the psychoactive effects of high potency are much more significant. Is this also true for like street marijuana? Just, uh, you know, is this something that's only happening in the licit market? Or have you also seen significant innovation um, outside of it? There's no difference anymore between the illicit and illicit markets, right? If you can have a licit grower, it's very easy to divert. In fact, what you're seeing in most legal jurisdictions is that most of the sales, 70, 80, 90 percent of the sales are still happening in unlicensed, from unlicensed distributors, um, the gray market, as it were, uh, because they don't have deal with the regulations so the prices are lower so it's this weird wild west where um basically you have these essentially illegal stores retail stores but then you don't have police shutting them down right exactly um 
so you, you know, potency matters intrinsically. Potency matters for the long term uh, uh, psychological effects of marijuana. Um, the stuff that I find most persuasive here is that there really does seem to be this now pretty good evidence of uh, a relationship between heavy adolescent marijuana use and later onset schizophrenia in adulthood. Um, that's a real and substantial risk. But to me, that is, you know, a concern, but less of a concern than, as you alluded to, between 10 and 30 percent of people who use marijuana will develop what's called a cannabis use disorder, which is what we'd call marijuana di- addiction. Is it deadly in the way that fentanyl addiction is? No. Is it debilitating to quality of life, to personal well-being, to relationships, to ability to flourish? Yeah, absolutely. In the same way that many other addictions are. Um, I would argue that you you can say it is a similar kind to... Uh, lots of different kinds of addictions. Um, and I think that that is increasingly recognized, including the quote-unquote mainstream media, but still not widely recognized. People don't understand that marijuana is an addictive substance and will be subject to all of the pressures, cultural and economic, that are associated with addictive substances, which is really what gives me pause about the commercialization of marijuana. Does marijuana addiction divert people away from opioid addiction and other more dangerous addictions? Uh, no, probably not. Um, the, the There are 8,000 studies a year on this, uh, and everybody fights about it. The most persuasive study that I have seen that built on follow-ups to prior studies looks at the long run of the effects of legalization and infers that there's not really a meaningful effect on opioid consumption or opioid overdose, um, which to me is a sign that uh, in some cases there may be a substitution effect. In some cases there may be a gateway effect. It probably all cancels out in the end. Um, so I do not find persuasive the idea that uh, people are meaningfully substituting from opioids to marijuana. The late political scientist Mark Kleiman uh, famously argued that the great danger as we hurtle towards marijuana legalization was that, uh, as you suggested, uh, we would see the advent of big highly efficient for-profit companies um, that would profit from binge consumption uh, and essentially uh, addicting large numbers of people. Um, And he proposed a variety of kind of in-between measures, perhaps recognizing, perhaps lamenting uh, that the prospect of outright prohibition, stringently enforced prohibition, you know, for whatever reason, it become culturally anathema. So, you know, you express some skepticism about some of these non-profit um, you know, approaches where you have a kind of regulated market that is designed to be crippled, that's designed to inhibit, um, you know, effective profit-making um, activity. Uh, but I wonder what you see as some in-between measures. You know, let's stipulate that, um, you know, we're not going to go to hardcore prohibition next week. Uh, you know, maybe you could say you could gradually try to make the cultural case to make that a possibility again. But, you know, we live in the real world here. So I'm curious, you know, what you think about a kind of middle ground that would help mitigate some of the ills uh, of what we see in, in the cannabis market today. Ultimately, I think many of Kleiman's proposals make sense. I would be sympathetic to them. And can you elaborate on some of them, perhaps? Yeah. And you see, when, when, when Kleiman actually swung on, he was opposed to marijuana for a long time and he swings on it. Um, in his book Against Excess, and he said what, what he proposes is a, a government-administered mail-order system with users registered, and you can only purchase a certain amount. Um, I am sympathetic to the possibility of a state store system working better, or a state-run dispensary system, because A, you can set maximum consumption limits, and B, you can internalize uh, you can internalize the cost, you can access government taxes more efficiently. Um you know, if you, if you could legalize personal consumption and growing small numbers of plants while retaining criminalization of uh, of commercial sales, um, I might be open to that versus sort of stringent prohibition. But I think it is really very important that that not only has not happened in the United States, but was never going to happen in the United States. That is not what we are as a country. Part of what makes us great as a country, I you know, we were talking about the regulation of goods on the Manhattan Institute podcast, so I feel like I should say, I am in most cases an unreconstructed fan of capitalism. Um, capitalism is wonderful and great because it gives people things that they want uh, cheaply and easily. It creates abundance. The problem is when it creates an abundance in things that kill people or make their lives terrible, which is what happens in markets in addictive substances, um, markets and drugs. Uh, so in that specific and narrow case, you know, I think in part because America is so 
uh, is 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 a capitalist country to its enormous advantage um, because it's embraced those virtues. We were never going to, as a policy matter, implement the kind of system that Kleiman wanted. It wasn't it wasn't going to happen. Um, and I think he 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 never really grokked that. I think there are people who are looking at the situation in Canada, looking at the situation in America today, who pushed for legalization versus the prohibitions in the 80, 80s and 90s, and is going, well. This is not what we were expecting to happen, but it was kind of predictable. Uh, I noted earlier on that there was this dramatic shift in public opinion uh, on cannabis legalization and that there seems to have been a more recent change. I wonder if you could talk to us a bit about the most recent developments in the politics of marijuana control. Yeah. Um, so I think there were a couple of different factors, a couple of different events Um in general, marijuana legalization is spreading, although sort of as a bellwether, the state of Oklahoma um, said no to recreational. They have sort of a thriving medical industry, so it's not quite clear what that means. But it would be interesting if we've hit sort of the upper limit on states being willing to legalize if we stop at around 30-ish, uh, if that's if that's the end of, and we have a patchwork policy for a long time. Um, similarly, the Biden administration is moving towards rescheduling marijuana. Um, marijuana is previously a Schedule One drug and the Schedule Controlled Substances, uh, which means it's highly addictive, has no medical applications. That would make it Schedule Three, which means it's moderately addictive, has some medical applications. There's a review process. I think that's... I have opinions about that, but I, what I think is interesting there is the politics of it. Joe Biden was the only Democrat in the 2020 primary... So yes, uh, in the 2020 primary, who did not come out and favor the legalization of marijuana. He is an old school drug warrior. Uh, that's one of his better qualities. Uh, and so on the one hand, the question is, is the rescheduling at the federal level a prelude to a subsequent removal from the schedule overall, which would be effective fact of federal legalization? Or is it a compromise meant to stave off demands from the progressive wing of the party? I don't know. But to me, that's an extraordinarily interesting question is, you know, could we reach this period of stability and detente where some states have it, some states don't? It's kind of a mess. Uh, it's federally Schedule Two or Schedule Three, uh, but it's not fully legal. Could we get stuck in that equilibrium, or do we keep pushing forward to full legalization? It's unclear to me at this point. In addition to your prolific writing for City Journal, uh, your research output at the Manhattan Institute, uh, you also have a Substack called the Causal Fallacy that I recommend to everyone. Uh, just really thoughtful, smart stuff. What are you working on right now? What is the next uh, Charles Lehman uh, product going to be? I'm working on I'm working on a couple of research briefs. Um, actually, focused more on more on issues of race, um, uh, something about reparations, something about Black Hebrew Israelism. But then my hope is after that, I really will be focusing on a substantial portion of my attention will go towards drug policy. Um, in about a month, I'll be going to Vancouver to to visit the supervised consumption site to check out the situation because you know uh, Canada is really. The, the American progressive left is dreaming for drug policy right now, and I'm, I'm, my, my hope is to go report and see exactly what's happening there and uh, what we may or may not have to look forward to. And it does seem as though in Canada, too, there's a brewing backlash against uh, this policy direction. Charles, thank you so much for uh, joining me. This has been an incredible um, conversation. Just I've learned an enormous amount about the drug crisis, and I urge everyone to follow Charles closely. Um, his writing for City Journal, at the Causal Fallacy, uh, his research output, and of course he writes in, in other places too. Uh, and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. Listeners, don't forget to check out his work for the Manhattan Institute. We'll link to a scholar page in the podcast description. If you like what you heard on the podcast, please feel free to write a review wherever you listen. And be sure to tune in to future episodes of Manhattan Insights. I'm your host, Raihan Salam.